Craig Rochelle said, if God always met your expectations, he'd never have the opportunity to exceed them. Every one of us has expectations in life for just about everything, don't we? Uh, we have expectations for our marriages, our jobs, our families. The fact is, our day-to-day -day lives are full of expectations for just about everything. And that's good. You know, there's nothing wrong with having expectations. As long as we don't allow those expectations to dictate our responses to situations and circumstances and relationships when those expectations go unmet, right? Because that's, that's when our expectations can get us into trouble because when you're expecting a particular outcome in a relationship or some situation or circumstance you're facing, and yet what you're expecting to happen doesn't happen, well, first of all, you understand it's not because God forgot you were there. Right? It's not because he was supposed to do something on your behalf and missed it. No, God doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't forget you when you're facing something big in your life. And furthermore, he never stops working on your behalf, even though you may not see any evidence of him doing anything in your life at all. But that's where we get ourselves into trouble sometimes, because you can become so focused on your expectations for what you think is going to happen that you miss what is actually happening Often something far greater that God is doing in your life that will exceed all of your expectations. See, as Christians, we, because we have a relationship with Jesus and, and we have his word and therefore we know things about Jesus, we sometimes assume we know what to expect from him in any given situation without actually asking him first. The problem with approaching life that way, especially when times are hard, is that just as life isn't always predictable, well, neither is he. Okay, we serve a God who cannot be defined or contained or controlled, a God who's not predictable or limited by our expectations. And if you need proof of that, all you have to do is turn to Scripture where there are as many as 400 prophecies in the Old Testament concerning the Messiah. And for centuries before the Messiah actually came to the earth as a man, the Jews were not only watching and waiting for him to come, but they were also diligently learning and teaching one another those same scriptures that described him and how he would come. Okay, they knew more about the Messiah than anyone else on earth at the time. And yet when he finally did show up, the vast majority of them missed it. They didn't recognize the very person they'd fashioned their entire lives and culture to reflect. And despite the profound and undeniable impact that Jesus has had on the earth since then, it remains true that the majority of the Jewish community and humanity in general, for that matter, continues to overlook the person and work of Jesus as the Messiah. And so for the religious Jews, for instance, they're still waiting for the Messiah to come 2,000 years after Jesus' arrival on the earth. Uh, the 12th century rabbi, Maimonides, was one of the most prolific and influential Torah scholars of the Middle Ages. He wrote in the Mishnah Torah concerning the Messiah, I'm quoting, he said, anyone who does not believe in him or who does not wait for his arrival has not merely denied the other prophets, but has also denied the Torah and Moses, our rabbi. Listen, that was written nearly 1,200 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In other words, he's saying we don't recognize Jesus as the Messiah, so we're still waiting for him to come. The same people who were supposed to know more about the Messiah than anyone, the same people whose lives and community and culture were fashioned around a messianic expectation for God's chosen ones, the same people failed to recognize him when he was standing right there in front of them. In fact, Jesus said to them, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life and it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. John 5, 39 and 40, at a glance, it's, it's hard to fathom how the balance of God's chosen people, the ones who claim to belong to him, could fail to recognize who Jesus actually was and what he was doing on the earth while he was right there among them. But it's because they thought they already knew everything they needed to know about him. So when he came and lived in ways they never expected, well, they ignored his voice in their lives. But honestly, I wonder sometimes if Jesus were to walk into our churches today, would we recognize him? Because the truth is he might not act or look like you'd expect him to. 
that was certainly the case the first time that he came. And nowhere is that more evident than in the last week of his life on earth, including Palm Sunday, which, of course, we're celebrating today, the week before Resurrection Sunday, where just in that one week, Jesus systematically shatters the expectations of everyone around him for both the Jews and the Gentiles. Uh, first of all, the Jews expected a king, right? A king in the line and tradition of David to come in on a war horse. What they got instead was a man in peasant's clothing accompanied by common people riding on a donkey of peace. They expected validation as God's chosen people. What they got instead was driven out of the temple by Jesus for their sin. They expected religious pretentiousness, arrogance. What they got instead was a man willing to give himself up for the very people who were mocking him, beating him, cursing him, and ultimately killing him. For the Jews, Jesus was just one shattered expectation after another. And to the Gentiles, look, the cross was foolishness. In Acts 17, we find the Apostle Paul in Athens teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, but it was foolishness to them because the Gentiles believed in human reason above everything else. Uh, as George Renault put it, he says, reason tells you that babies aren't born to virgin girls. Reason tells you that God doesn't become flesh. Reason tells you that Almighty God will not allow puny men to nail him to a cross Reason tells you that when a man dies, he cannot be resurrected back to life again. None of that makes any sense. For the Gentiles, the cross was foolishness. You see, Jesus was so unpredictable, he simply did not meet anyone's expectations. And in the process, most of the people who encountered him failed to recognize who he was because he was completely counter to the culture and the expectations of the culture, even uh, even the religious culture, and the truth is, if we're being honest, not much has changed in that regard. Right? There are plenty of professing believers today who are more interested in winning theological arguments based on God's word than they are with winning people's hearts based on God's will. It's exactly what the Pharisees love to do. At the same time, there are professing Christians today who believe that moral truth or justification, listen, even biblical truth, is relative malleable, flexible, according to the culture or society that it's being expressed in, which is exactly what the pagan Gentile philosophers believed. See, but then along came Jesus, and he ruined it for everybody because he didn't meet anyone's expectations. The truth is, every one of us today has expectations concerning Jesus. We all do, which is why it's so very important for us to honestly assess what those expectations are are actually based upon, right? Are your expectations of Jesus Christ based on popular sentiment about him or religious traditions or even your own preferences about what you want God to be like? Because if they are, look, when times are hard, you can become spiritually fragmented or frustrated with a God who isn't responding the way you want him to or expect him to. Or are those expectations of Jesus based on how he actually lived and what he actually taught and what he's actually saying to you today. Because often, listen, when you peel back the layers of expectations that we all have about Jesus, you'll find that so much of what we hold to be true about him is based on things we've been told about him by others our entire lives that may or may not be entirely true. Or on religious traditions that may or may not have their roots in scripture or on popular culture that constantly wants to tell us how we should think about God, or even on our own preferences about how we would like for him to respond to our needs. But listen, Jesus isn't just some kind of sage who came to spread a philosophy that affirms our positive feelings about ourselves. And he isn't just a religious leader who came to give us a better religion to follow either. No, Jesus is a king who came to establish his kingdom. Right? In the most unpredictable, unexpected way possible. And that's what Palm Sunday is all about. The revelation of Jesus, our King. And so today and next week, we're going to look at a story that we revisit, of course, each year as we recognize this profound day in the life of Christ. And in the process, why don't we allow some of our expectations about him to be challenged in light of what he actually did and what he actually taught about himself and what he's actually saying to us today, which, by the way, may not only change how we view Jesus, but may well change how we view ourselves 
and how we view our own lives in light of who he actually is. So we'll be reading from the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 12, beginning with verses uh, 12 through 15, if you want to turn there with me. This is the moment Jesus makes his triumphant entry into the city of Jerusalem just before the Passover feast. John 12, 12 through 15. The next day, the large crowd had come to the feast, uh, who had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, so they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. So devout Jews are gathering in Jerusalem for the Passover feast. Verse 12 describes it as a large crowd. Scholars, including the first century Jewish historian Flavius Josephus, actually estimated the crowd to have been over 2,700,000 people. I just try to picture... Uh, that in your mind for a moment. I think it's hard for us to do sometimes because in the uh, sort of cinematic renderings, right, the movies and shows we see that, that record this event, Jesus comes riding in surrounded by dozens of people lining the road, right? You can only pay so many actors, I guess. So I think that's how we tend to see it in our minds, but that doesn't even come close to what this scene was actually like. The sheer immensity of the crowd gathered to hail the entrance of the one who they were expecting to lead a revolt against their Roman oppressors. It must have been a staggering sight to behold, and they were cutting palm branches from the trees and throwing them down on the road before him and waving them in the air because palm branches symbolized Jewish nationalism and victory in their culture. In fact, images of palm branches were even stamped on the temple coins dating all the way back from the time of the Maccabees. Uh, there was a revolt from 167 B.C. to 160 B.C., where a man named Judas Maccabeus miraculously led Israel into victory over the Syrian occupation. And upon that great victory, the crowd celebrated by pulling palm branches off the trees and waving them in the air, signifying their military triumph over their enemies, which serves to help us understand the mindset, right, the expectations of these two million-plus Jews toward Jesus as he rode into the city that day, while they once again wave palm branches in the air. That's why it's called uh, Palm Sunday. And in anticipation of Jesus leading a military revolt, just like Judas Maccabeus against the Roman occupation this time, they were also shouting a couple verses of, uh, from Psalm 118. It's one of the Psalms of Ascents as they threw the palm branches down before him and again waved them in the air. And we know from Luke 19 that shortly after this, Jesus weeps over Jerusalem because of his great love for the people, which was driving him to do what would otherwise be unthinkable. He's about to give up his own life for them. And so the Jews are expecting Jesus to ride into the city before millions of people chanting his name, declaring him king over Israel on the best looking perfectly fit and most intimidating war horse that could be found, the only animal befitting a king. And yet Jesus rides in on a donkey, the exact opposite of what they expected. Now, why, why in the world, given the opportunity before him to impress that many people, the people he loves, the people he's so passionate about, why would Jesus choose to ride into the city on a donkey. Well, it's because Jesus wasn't coming to fulfill their expectations. He was coming to fulfill his destiny as a humble and compassionate Savior. They expected their king to be proud, even arrogant, but Jesus was a humble king. Everything that he did, he did with a humble heart. In fact, his entrance into Jerusalem on a donkey was prophesied 500 years earlier in Zechariah 9.9, which specifically describes the coming of the humble king on the back of a donkey. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you righteous and having salvation is he humble and mounted on a donkey on a colt, the foal of a donkey. You see, the heart of Christ, the same heart, by the way, that is supposed to be in his people today, is always clothed in humility. There's no room for ego. There's no room for pride. There's no room for self-centeredness or arrogance. When the apostle Paul says, 
We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, 2 Corinthians 10, 5. When the apostle Peter says, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, 1 Peter 3, 15. When Jude, the brother of Jesus, says, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints, Jude 1, 3. They're all talking about winning hearts, not just winning arguments. In fact, if you go back and read each one of those scriptures in its larger context, they all talk about showing humility, gentleness, respect, and mercy in the process. By the way, true humility is not simply acting some certain way around people. According to scripture, humility is actually the state of of one's own heart. The word translated as humility throughout the New Testament in the original Greek literally means a deep sense of of one's own littleness. That's not simply acting humble or saying the right things or even doing the right things. It's more than that. True humility is a deep sense of one's own littleness. You understand, this is supposed to be one of the hallmarks of the church, something that Christians were supposed to be famous for, our humility, always putting others before ourselves, always showing mercy, knowing that not one of us, not one of us deserves the mercy that has been extended to us by God, right? Always letting go of our offenses, always laying down our pride, always admitting when we're wrong, always asking for forgiveness when we've hurt someone else, always forgiving others when they've hurt us, always being soberly aware of our own littleness in light of the greatness of the one who lives inside of us, right? If we have the Spirit of Christ living inside of us, then humility should be part and parcel of our very identity as believers and followers of Jesus Christ. Humility, our own sense of littleness. It should be at the very core of who we are, which happens to be incompatible, by the way, to the message of our culture. But listen, Jesus didn't fit in with the culture either. They wanted him to be proud, even arrogant, but he didn't give them what they wanted. You see, Jesus didn't give people what they wanted. He gave them what they needed. And likewise, Jesus didn't send us out into the world to give people what they want. He sent us into the world to give people what they need. This world needs the truth. And they need it bathed in humility. Scottish evangelist Oswald Chambers wrote, Never water down the word of God, but preach it in its undiluted sternness. There must be unflinching faithfulness to the word of God, but when you come to personal dealings with others, remember who you are. You're not some special being created in heaven, but a sinner saved by grace. This world needs the truth undiluted, and they need it bathed in humility. Because look, you, let me tell you, you can speak absolute truth to lost people. But if that message is spoken out of pride and arrogance, the only thing they will see or hear in that message is you. That's a fact. You can speak all the truth you want to people, but if it's spoken out of uh, pride and arrogance, all they will hear or see is you. Because pride points people back to yourself. Humility points people to Christ. I mean, just be honest, when you see Christians arguing on social media or in person for that matter, and they're being particularly arrogant or prideful, and look, I, I know how passionate people can be about things like pandemics and politics and the, theological arguments. Those are many of those things, big, important topics that need to be discussed and acted upon. And of course, they stir up many different powerful emotions in many different people. But listen, no matter how true or even powerful our arguments may be about the gospel or God or how he will respond to this crisis or those politics or anything else, if there is an overwhelming air of arrogance and pride in our delivery, then the person you're talking to, I guarantee you they're not thinking about Jesus when you speak. They're thinking about you because pride always points people back to ourselves. Humility points people to Jesus. By the way, the humility that's described in the Bible, that deep sense of one's own littleness is not a devaluing of yourself. It's not beating yourself down. No, it's an ever-present awareness of who Christ is in you and what he has done for you, which should result in a profound sense of worth and value, and at the same time, a profound understanding that without him, 
we are nothing. Pastor and theologian Timothy Keller said it this way. He said, the Christian gospel is that I'm so flawed that Jesus had to die for me, yet I'm so loved and valued that Jesus was glad to die for me. This leads to deep humility and deep confidence at the same time. It undermines both swaggering and sniveling. I cannot feel superior to anyone, and yet I have nothing to prove to anyone. I do not think more of myself nor less of myself. Instead, I think of myself less. Let's keep reading, verses 16 through 19. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see, you're gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. So interestingly, verse 16 says that not even Jesus, his closest friends, understood what he was doing or what was happening. And these were the men and women who knew him the best at this point, right? The people who had been with him for years, watching him live out the gospel every day, listening to him teach about who he was and what he'd come to do. And yet they still didn't understand what was happening, even though their own scriptures clearly described what he was doing. And in the exact detail in which he was doing it, 500 years before it ever happened. Okay, there's, there's no two ways about it. Jesus was a misunderstood king because he defied everyone's expectations of himself, even those who knew him the best. Right? I mean, think about it. What kind of king secures the victory over his enemy by allowing himself to be killed? Logically, that doesn't make any sense, but Jesus didn't come to satisfy the world. He came to satisfy the Father. And look, if your greatest desire in this life is to satisfy Jesus Christ above all other desires, then there will absolutely be times in your life when other people, including your closest friends and family, will not always understand why you're doing what you're doing or saying what you're saying or helping who you're helping or going where you're going or giving what you're giving. Because following Jesus Christ often looks like the opposite of what we think it should look like. And so as you pursue his leading with true humility, other people will at times question your choices. I'm telling you they will. They'll question your judgment. They'll question your motivation. They'll question your decisions, your actions, your wisdom. And they'll question the direction you're taking. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about because you've experienced what I'm talking about firsthand. For those of you who haven't, you can go ahead and write this down and post it on your refrigerator for future reference. If you are truly following Jesus Christ, there will be times in your life when you will be deeply misunderstood by others, even those who are closest to you. It is a fact that I've experienced in my own life and was clearly evident in Jesus' life. Just listen to what Jesus says to those who come to him, telling him they want to follow him. So these people are coming up to Jesus and saying, hey, we want to follow you. He said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. What? What does that even mean? Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Bear his own cross? That means die a horrible death. What are you talking about? For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he's laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he's able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any of you who does not renounce all that he has... You cannot be my disciple. Luke 14, 26 through 33. In other words, you say you want to follow me, but you better count the cost before you make that decision because following me is going to cost you everything that you have. Well, Jesus, why are you saying that? Don't you want people to follow you? I'm supposed to hate my father and mother 
By the way, that word hate in verse 26, it's an ancient Semitic expression. Uh, it meant to love less. Jesus is saying, you have to love me more than anything or anyone else in your life. You have to love me more than your own family. In fact, you have to love me more, including and especially than you love yourself if you're going to follow me. That's why you have to bear your own cross. Allow your will to die so that my will can be accomplished in your life. I mean, honestly, are these the kind of things a king says when he's trying to recruit an army? Look, Jesus was misunderstood. And you will be too when you follow him because you're no longer trying to satisfy the world when you're following Jesus. You're only trying to satisfy him. And that's going to lead you to places and people and decisions and actions that the people around you will not understand. Sometimes even those who are closest to you. So look. If pleasing other people above everything else is one of the chief motivations inside of you that drives you to do the things you do, then I'm just telling you, you're going to struggle at times in your life with pleasing God. Because sometimes doing or saying what is pleasing to God means doing or saying what is anything but pleasing to other people. You understand, sometimes what feels right and what is right are two very different things. Sometimes truly loving people means doing and saying things that are not pleasing to them at all. Author Bob Goff said, loving people the way Jesus did means living a life of being constantly misunderstood. Let's keep reading, verses 20 through 26. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. So Jesus just continues to torpedo people's expectations of him as two men come looking for him, wanting to see him. And yet he doesn't even seem to acknowledge their desire for a meeting to begin with. He doesn't give them what they want to hear. But he does give them what they need to hear. Whoever lo loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. He knew what was on their hearts. And as they were about to find out, Jesus didn't just speak this truth. He lived it as he gave all that he had, his very life, for the will of the Father. You see, Jesus was a sacrificial king, and there's simply no getting around this aspect of truly following Christ. Now, of course, that doesn't keep us from trying, right? Because nobody enjoys sacrifice. Forfeiting what you want for the sake of what God wants is never easy, and yet you simply cannot follow Jesus Christ without experiencing life-altering sacrifice. You hear me? You can't follow Jesus Christ without experiencing life-altering sacrifice because following Jesus Christ means dying to yourself. Whoever loses his life, loves his life, loses it. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Well, gee, doesn't the alternative sound better? Of course it does. But that doesn't change what Jesus said. You still have to give yourself up. You have to submit everything to him if you want to follow after him. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Matthew 7, 13 and 14, Jesus said, The gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard. The way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. He didn't leave a lot of room for debate there, did he? Not a lot of room for other interpretations or lengthy discussions about what he may have meant. He simply said, if you're not willing to sacrifice your life for mine, then you cannot follow me. That was so unexpected. And yet so clear that people either followed him or they walked away. Actually, in the first century, there was not a lot of in-between. There, there was no benefit back then to sort of following Jesus. Once he made it clear the personal cost involved in following him, you were either all in or you were all out. And, he, and by the way, Jesus didn't try to coax people into following him. He never told people what he thought they wanted to hear in the hopes they might decide to follow him. 
No, when, the, when these Gentiles came to see Jesus, he didn't even bother to meet with them. He just said to his disciples, go tell them what it's going to cost them to follow me, namely everything. Jesus never told people what he thought they wanted to hear to try and convince them to follow him. And yet, in the modern church, <clears throat> we've become experts at trying to package the message and craft our church culture in a way that is the least offensive and the most attractive in the hopes of coaxing people into our churches and into the kingdom of God. But that's not what he called us to do. He called us to sacrifice our lives, to utterly disown what we want for the sake of what he wants. And listen, ultimately, that will truly attract people to our churches and to the kingdom of God. When the world sees the church living and giving selflessly, sacrificing our lives of comfort and security and predictability and instead pursuing Christ with radical abandonment. Then when we tell people about Jesus based on his truth and the evidence of it that we see, uh, that they see in our lives, they'll either run toward him or they'll run away from him, but there won't be much in between. I'm convinced that when the biblical authors talk about suffering, they're not talking about persecution. They're talking about dying to themselves. If you just read through the New Testament, when it came time for persecution, Paul is like, bring it on. Let's go. To live as Christ, to die as gain. I'm, I win either way. I don't care. You can kill me. Peter said, hey, why don't you just, while you're nailing me here, just turn me upside down. I don't care. Kill me. They didn't run from persecution or, or uh, torture, even death, martyrdom, none of them. But when every single one of them talks about dying to themselves, they talk about suffering. That is a much harder thing for us to do, to die to self. Author and pastor Erwin Lutzer once said, those who give much without sacrifice are reckoned as having given little. Let's finish the story for today, verses 27 and 28. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I've come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The word troubled in verse 27 is the Greek word terasso. It means to be stirred up or to be unsettled. So just after explaining that his time to die had come back in verse 23, Jesus asks a rhetorical question. He says, is my soul stirred up? unsettled well in fact we know that it was because of his prayer later in the garden of gethsemane and so he continues what should i do should i ask the father to spare me which is exactly what he does later in his prayer to the father and yet at the same time he understands that he must be obedient to the father's will no matter the cost so he answers his own question he says i know that it is for this very purpose to die that i'm here so I must be obedient to my calling, which he expresses when he says, Father, glorify your name, because Jesus knew that in his death, the Father would be glorified. In other words, no matter how hard this gets, I'm going to be obedient to my Father's will. Okay, Jesus was an obedient king, which was totally unexpected, right? Who does a king submit to? Who does a king answer to? Who does a king obey? Yet Jesus denied his own will in obedience to the Father's will. In the Garden of Gethsemane, just before his crucifixion, he prayed, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Luke twenty two forty two. Jesus denied his own will in order to satisfy the Father's will, which is the very picture of obedience. And of course, if you've been following Jesus for any amount of time at all, you already know how difficult that can be. It's so hard sometimes to deny what we want in deference to what he wants, but Jesus couldn't be any clearer on the matter. He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Luke six forty six. In other words, look, you can't call me Lord. If you don't do what I tell you, if you refuse to obey my commands, then clearly I'm not your Lord. You understand, confession without obedience is worthless. It means nothing. 
Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who's in heaven, Matthew 7, 21. He also said, my mother and my brothers, in other words, the church, are those who hear the word of God and do it, Luke 8, 21. And Luke eleven twenty eight. 28, he said, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Okay, confession without obedience is worthless. And Look, it's not that following the rules uh, is what saves us, not at all. The people of God tried that in the Old Testament and proved unequivocally that we will never be able to follow enough religious rules to be saved. We are saved by His grace through our faith alone, period. Obedience is simply one of the evidences. It's one of the proofs that we genuinely follow Christ. Not perfection, but a genuine desire and ongoing effort to obey the word of God and the calling of God on our lives, which is what Jesus, our King, demonstrated for us by his own actions, which was not only unexpected, it was downright shocking that this King, this Messiah, this Savior, would come to the earth as a man in such humility, knowing he would be so misunderstood, and yet he sacrificed everything in obedience to the Father's will, which, by the way, troubled him deeply. Right after praying, Father, not my will, but yours be done, Luke says, in being in agony. Jesus was in agony over what the Father was asking him to do. Being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground just before he did the unthinkable, sacrificing his perfect life for a world who wasn't even asking for it. Jesus defied everyone's expectations of him as he rode into Jerusalem that day. And he's been defying expectations ever since. And look, the world doesn't need a less offensive or a more culturally acceptable version of Jesus. They just need Jesus. The same Jesus who offered people what they needed instead of what they wanted. The same Jesus who lived to satisfy the Father instead of those around him. The same Jesus who gave up his own life to save others. The same Jesus who denied his own will in obedience to his calling. He lived a life that no one expected and yet he's calling you and me to live that very same kind of life today. No matter how bad our circumstances may be or may become because his word never changes on the matter no matter what we are afflicted by and he never changes no matter how much we do which means we don't live our lives according to what the news says or politicians say or our fears tell us or even what our own personal preferences may be no we live according to the calling and command of our king jesus christ and look sometimes people won't recognize you when you live that way it's okay because they didn't recognize jesus either because his life had absolutely nothing to do with satisfying other people's expectations of him and do you know what neither does yours let's pray